Travellers, the strains of Eternal Father, Strong to Save, Fade Away, may I warmly welcome you to this week's podcast. We recommend that you find somewhere quiet and somewhere peaceful to help shut out worldly distractions so that we can focus on God himself. Let's open with a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're there all the time when we perceive it and when we don't. Father, we're sorry that at times it's only when we're having difficulties that we tend to seek your face. When things are going well, we just tend to ignore you. For that, we are truly sorry. So, Lord, we come before you now in humility as your sons and daughters. And, Father, we pray that we might sense the presence of your good self, but also have the sense of being part of a larger community. Lord, your church of which you are the head. And we pray this in and through the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Well, we're going to have a psalm today, and it's Psalm 85. And Mike is going to lead us with this psalm, so I do hope you join in. We're going to read together Psalm 85. I'll read the light type, and if you'll respond with the bold type. Lord, you were favourable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin. You withdraw all your wrath. You turn from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation towards us. Will you be angry with us for ever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, so that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet, righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him, and will make a path for his steps. Well, this psalm speaks of God restoring his favour to his people. And certainly, for our land, we need God's favour at this moment. Our scripture reading today is from the book of Matthew. We are going through the account of Jesus' ministry in Matthew and we're picking up the narrative following the feeding of the 5,000. So our scripture reading today is from Matthew 14 and is entitled Jesus Walks on Water. And Mike's going to lead us in the reading of this scripture now. Our gospel reading comes from Matthew's gospel, chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. Only God has authority over nature. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking towards them on the sea, But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This well-known Bible story has some real lessons, some real spiritual lessons to teach us. The key verse in the whole of the reading is at the end where it says, And those in the boat worshipped him. 
they had come to understand that Jesus truly was the Son of God. Contrary to the Greek and Roman culture of the day, Judaism was fiercely monotheistic. The only person who could be worshipped was God himself. We can think of the Ten Commandments, the first one being, of course, you shall have no other gods before me. Only God is worthy of worship. The tragic history of the Old Testament, of course, is that the Jewish nation time and time again felt the temptation of worshipping the gods of the surrounding nations, the gods who were no gods, but ones that suited their own proclivities better. We, of course, are no better. Often we worship things which are not God, whether it be our own status and wealth, or whether it be a football team or a pop idol. It's all the same stuff, really. Jesus, in his time of temptation in the wilderness, finds that Satan is tempting him to worship Satan on the basis that Satan will give him all the nations of the world. And Jesus responds with scripture from Deuteronomy, worship the Lord your God and serve him him only. Matthew in his gospel has an underlying purpose and that is to reveal Jesus as being the true Messiah, the true King of Israel. And up until this point the disciples themselves have not specifically affirmed Christ as the Messiah, as the King of Israel. Chapter 14 of Matthew starts off with the execution of John the Baptist And a little bit earlier, while John was in prison, John sends a message to Jesus. And he says this, Are you the one who is to come, or should we seek another? John, even John the Baptist, is going through a time of doubt and evaluation. And of course, Jesus reassures him that he is the Christ by pointing to all the miraculous things that he's doing Although the disciples hadn't specifically affirmed Jesus as the Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah, at this point, others had in the account. If we go right back to the baptism of Jesus, we find God the Father affirming the Son with the Holy Spirit coming down as a dove with the words, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. We can think of the response of some of the people that Jesus healed. There's a lovely account in John chapter 9 where Jesus heals a man who is born blind. And later on in the discourse, the man is found by Jesus again and asks him whether he believes in the Son of Man. And the healed man says, who is he? And Jesus said, I am he. And the blind man responds, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. He worshipped him. It's interesting, in cases where people worship Jesus, Jesus never reprimands them. He never says that they're doing the wrong thing. He accepts that they are recognising him for who he truly is. And that is God incarnate, God in the flesh. And therefore, he is worthy of all honour and worship. It's striking that even the evil spirits recognise who Jesus was. We have got the case of a man in the synagogue who had an unclean spirit. He cries out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So our reading today, I'd like us to think of it as a process by which Jesus is leading his disciples to a place where they truly recognise who he is and affirm that in themselves. The reading starts off just after the feeding of the 5,000. In John's Gospel, we find that after this wonderful miracle by which the people had been fed, Jesus realised that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. And so he withdrew again to the mountain by himself, which fits in with our reading today. Well, in a sense, Jesus was their king. And uh, there's a degree of recognition there, isn't there? But Jesus knew that just becoming their political leader was not what the father had asked him to do. He was not only coming to be their king, 
but he was going to become their saviour as well. And without going through Calvary Road, through the cross, the death and the resurrection, yes, he could be their political king, but he could not be their saviour. He could not rescue them from judgment and death. So Jesus sends his disciples by boat across the lake to Capernaum. He, after all the stresses of the day, retires and goes up the mountain by himself to pray, to commune with his heavenly Father. It's interesting, but throughout the whole of this account, Jesus is sovereignly in control of events. He dismisses the crowd and they go. He orders his disciples. He makes them get in the boat and head off across the lake. He has a purpose and that purpose is going to work itself out. Well, Jesus, in his sovereignty, is actually sending his disciples into a storm. The Lake of Galilee, at its widest point, is only about eight miles across. So the journey from one side to another shouldn't have taken more than a couple of hours or so. But we find that they face a difficult time, that the storm arrives, and it is contrary to their progress, and they're battling against it really getting nowhere. I suppose it's to their credit that they persevered rather than just turning back and giving it up as a bad job. By the time that Jesus appears to them, this is the fourth watch of the night, as some scriptures tell us, which meant that they'd been battling away till some time between three and six o'clock in the morning. They were having great difficulty. And then Jesus enters the picture. There's no big build-up. It's very matter-of-fact, and it says, and early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. Well, why not? He is the Lord of all creation. This is not a problem for him. Water or whatever will not prevent his progress. It's interesting as well, isn't it? There's maybe there's a lesson here for us, that often it's when we're having a tough time when all the winds and storms of life seem to be battering against us, where we seem to be getting nowhere. It's when we have come to the end of our own strength and our own resources that Jesus supernaturally steps into the situation. The disciples are terrified by this appearance of Jesus, and Jesus reassures them by saying, It is I. Interestingly enough, if we looked at the Greek rather than the English translation, the words literally say, I am. Jesus is declaring, I am. And those of you who have been following our Bible Plus series on that particular phrase, I am, ego eimi in the Greek, understand that it has a great significance and that it in fact is the name of God. It's translated as Yahweh in the Old Testament. So, in a sense, Jesus is saying, don't be afraid, God is here. Peter's response to the arrival of Jesus is remarkable. If I'd been in that boat, I'd have wanted Jesus to come and help us. And the thought of actually getting out of the boat and walking towards Jesus would have been the last thing on my mind. Yet we know that Peter, for all of his impetuosity, at times was given to great spiritual insight and great faith, flawed character though he was. And he says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus tells him to come. And Peter gets out of the boat and remarkably, in the power of Christ, like his master, starts to walk on the water. But oh, how like us when Jesus invites us out of our own comfort zone to do things which are beyond our own capabilities, which require divine input, divine strength, we suddenly start to look at the situation with our own human eyes. While Peter was focused on Jesus, he did well enough. Then we know that he started looking at his surroundings, the strength of the wind, the height of the waves, looking at his physical situation, and he becomes frightened. And in that fear, he starts to sink. Jesus is teaching Peter the lesson of how to walk by faith and not by sight. 
It's interesting that Jesus doesn't remove Peter from his circumstances. The sea is still there, the wind is still blowing. Yet while Peter looks at Jesus, things are all right. Jesus meets Peter in his circumstances. And while Peter exercises his faith in Christ, he walks and doesn't sink. But when he starts to doubt and look at his circumstances, it is then that he starts to sink. And Peter then shouts out the words that many of us have shouted out at times in our lives where we felt that we are sinking beneath the waves of our circumstances. Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reaches out his hand and catches him saying, Oh, you little faith, why did you doubt? But we should remember that Peter did get out of the boat and he did walk part of the way to Jesus on the water by faith in the Son of God. He made that step of faith. He didn't just sit in the boat, but he exercised his faith that this man Jesus was truly God himself. For who else could do these things? So then again, Jesus, in full command of the whole situation, lifts Peter and himself into the boat, and we're told that the wind ceased. The storm had done what Jesus wished it to do, and we're told that those in the boat worshipped him, and he didn't discourage them, but received their worship. They said, truly you are the Son of God. They had got the place of affirmation where they truly believed that this man who they'd followed for two years and had seen do so many miraculous things truly was of the same essence as the Father was God in the flesh. We find that later on in that day, when they get to the other side, the crowds have gone round the head of the lake, the north of the lake, and had found him. And Jesus gives his wonderful teaching about being the bread of life. He wasn't going to give them another physical meal, but what they really needed was a spiritual meal, and they just can't cope with it. And in the end, Jesus is left with the twelve, and Jesus asks them, Are you going to leave me as well? And they respond, we have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Again, an affirmation of Christ's deity. And this strength of affirmation by the disciples, who are going to be so instrumental in the forming of the church, is seen again in a couple of chapters' time, where Jesus turns to them and says, who do people say that I am? And there's lots of responses, where you're Elijah or you're Moses. And he then says to the disciples, And who do you say that I am? And Peter says, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responds to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but by my Father in heaven. And it reminds us that if we really are in our own spiritual lives, to really get it, to really understand that Jesus is the Son of God, that it's a work of grace. It's not something that our human minds readily can accept, but that when the Holy Spirit comes, one of his main missions is to reveal Jesus to us. It's interesting, but right at the end of John's Gospel, after he had written his spiritual gospel, he reveals to his readers what the purpose of this gospel was. And he writes in John 20, verse 31, But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Through this scripture, though, comes a challenge for you and I. And the challenge is the question of Jesus, who do you say that I am? It's probably the most important question you and I will ever have to answer. Because the consequences of our answer don't just affect the here and now, but they affect our eternal destiny. If Jesus truly was the Son of God, the perfect Lamb of God, that takes away the sins of the world. We can trust in him, knowing that through his work at Calvary, our sins are forgiven. Through our faith and trust in him, we can have life in his name. 
So at this point, I'd like you to just stop for a second and answer the question for yourself. Who do you say that Jesus is? And I hope that you may be able to affirm with conviction Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Amen. And so to our prayers of intercession. Father, we pray for ourselves. Lord, we pray for the strength and the faith and the courage, Lord, to get out of the boat and to walk to you. Father, we want to be able to walk by faith rather than just by sight. Forgive us, Lord, when we don't have the courage, Lord, to follow you. And Father, we pray that you may rekindle the power of your spirit in us, Lord, that we might be energised, Lord, to step out of our comfort zones and, Lord, to live for your glory. But Father, at this time as well, we think of those in our world who are in great need, we specifically think of the people who live in Beirut today, Lord, and they are having to cope with the devastation of their city and the devastation of their lives. And Father, we pray this prayer, which Christian Aid have come up with for us today, and we pray God our refuge in times of trouble. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Beirut today. Lord, be with the emergency services as they battle to help the thousands injured. Lord, hold those who have lost loved ones in the palm of your hand. Lord, we pray your provision for poor and marginalised communities who face an even more uncertain future. Lord, we pray for wisdom for leaders as they make difficult decisions. Lord, open our hearts. May they be full of compassion for the suffering we see. Stir us to action. In the tragedy of loss, we pray for your comfort. In the chaos and injury, we pray your calm and divine healing. In the devastation and the heartbreak, we pray your peace. We pray that in the despair that lies amid the rubble of the explosion, there will be glimmers of hope and life. And Father, in this dark hour, I pray just like you came to the disciples walking on the water in their moment of need, that Father, in the person of Jesus, by your Spirit, Lord, you may make yourself known to the people of Lebanon, that they might turn and recognise you, Lord Jesus, as the Saviour of the world. And it's in your name, Lord Jesus, that we pray this morning. And so to our final blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Till next week.